we begin in the dark and birth is the death of us. Who said that? Hegel. Sounds more like Beckett. He was paraphrasing Hegel. I don't think so. Whoever it was and whoever we are, dear sister, ever since we were born from the evils of Oedipus, what bitterness, pain, disgust, disgrace, or moral shock have we been spared? And now, this edict. You've heard the edict. I've heard no edict. That our two brothers are dead by one another's hands and the Argive army gone from this city is all I know. That's what I thought. That's why I called you out here. What's the matter? You have your thunder look. Creon is resolved to honor one of our brothers with burial, the other not. Teocles he has laid in the ground in accordance with justice and law. Polynicus is to lie unwept and unburied. Sweet sorry meat for the little lusts of the birds. Noble Creon draws our attention to this edict. Yours and my attention. Whoever transgresses it gets death. So what do you say? What could I say? What could I do? If you join me, if you join my action. At what risk? Where is your mind? If you help me, help me lift the corpse. Creon says unlawful to do so. Antigone says unholy not to. Oh, sister, don't cross this line. Sister dearest, my dead are mine and yours as well as mine. Whoever we are, think, sister. Father's daughter, daughter's brother, sister's mother, mother's son, his mother and his wife were one. Our families double, triple, degraded and dirty in every direction. Moreover, we too are alone and we are girls. Girls cannot force their way against men. Yet I will. Sweet sister, you aim too high. True sister, yet how sweet, how sweet to lie upon my brother's body, thigh to thigh. Your heart so hot, thou sister. Oh, one and only head of my sister whose blood intersects with my own in too many ways. The dead are cold. They'll welcome me. You are a person in love with the impossible. And when my strength is gone, I'll stop. It's wrong. Don't say that, or I'll have to hate you. He will hate you too. Just let me go, for I'll not endure anything so grievous as what robs me of a noble death. Go then. But know you go as one beloved, although you go without your mind. The glory, the glories of the world. The glories of the world come sharpening in all red and gold. We want the war.
Here comes Creon rowing his new powerboat. Now, here comes Creon <laughs> rowing his new powerboat. Here are Creon's verbs for today. Adjudicate, legislate, scandalize, capitalize. Here are Creon's nouns. Men, reason, treason, death, ship of state, mine. Mine isn't a noun. It is if you capitalize it. Well? Well what? Well we. Well we what? Well we saw someone. Saw someone what? Or actually no one. Was it someone or no one? Well, hypothetically. You goat's anus. Tell me who buried that body I said was unlawful to touch. Don't know. So find out. This, this. Let's not mention gods. Here's Antigone. Please don't say she's the one. She's the one. She did it. She did. I got her. Oh, perfect. Here's Creon. Whatever. Here's Creon. <laughs> Nick of time. Well, miracles do happen. I swore I wouldn't come back, but I did, because I got her. She's the one, she did it, and I got her. She was fiddling with the grave. I'm off the hook. Fiddling, what you mean, fiddling? I'm a free man, I'm free. I'm off the hook. Explain how you caught her. She was burying him. How, where, when, are you sure? Tell me more. The corpse, the illegal. She was burying him. What more do you want? Burying him how and 
Where did you see her, and how did you catch her? I want details. Details? Okay. You threatened me. I went back, wiped off all the dust, left that body bare, sat up on a hill. Was it hot? Yes. Was there putrefaction and vermiculation? Yes. Was there noon sun stink? Yes. Did I doze off? No, I did not. I kept me awake. Then, all of a sudden, a storm came up. A wind tore the hair off the trees, lofted the dust with fear. I shut my eyes, and when I sneaked to look, there she was, the child in her bird grief. The bird in her child reft grave cry, howling and cursing. She poured the dust onto the body with both hands. She poured water onto the body with both hands. I seized her, I charged her. It made me sad, but still that's less than my own safety. You like nouns? Here's some. Dust libation. Done deal. Dead reckoning. Actually, I'd prefer verbs. Got her. And you, with your head down, you're, you're the one? Bingo. Go. Exit dog. You knew it was against the law. Well, if you call that law. I do. Zeus does not. Justice does not. The dead do not. What they call law did not begin today or yesterday. When they say law, they do not mean a statute of today or yesterday. They mean the unwritten, unfailing, eternal ordinances of the gods that no human being can ever, ever, overturn or outrun. Of course I will die, Creon or no Creon, and death is fine. This has no pain. To leave my mother's son lying out there unburied, that would be pain. Raw as her father, isn't she? You think you are iron, but I can bend you. I'm the man here. <laughs> yes, I suppose you are. Uh, I'll bend your sister too. Can we just get this over with? No, let's split hairs a while longer. I'd say. You're the only one in Thebes who sees things this way, wouldn't you? You're <clears throat> autonomous. Yes. Autarchic. Autodidactic. Autodomestic. Uh, uh. Autoempathic. Autotherapeutic. <laughs> Autohistorical. Autometaphorical. Autoerotic. And uh, <clears throat> autobeguiled. Actually, no. They all think like me. But you, you've nailed their tongues to the floor. You're not ashamed. No shame in honoring one's kin. Wasn't the other brother your kin, too? Same mother, same father. Yet you honor the one, disgrace the other. My dead do not say so. The, the one a criminal, the, the other a defender of our land. Death needs to have death's laws obeyed. Oh, same law for good and evil, patriot and traitor? Oh, who knows how these definitions work down there. Enemy is always enemy, alive or dead. I am born for love, not hatred. I will not be worsted by a woman. <laughs> Enter 
Here is Ismene. Why is she blushing? Here is Ismene. Why is she snaking in here? I did the deed. I share the blame. You, you did nothing wrong. You shared nothing. Get out of my depth. Leave it alone. I want to row the boat with you. Save yourself. I'll be so lonely. Some think the world is made of bodies. Some think forces. I think a man knows nothing but his foot when he burns it in the hot fire. Quoting Hegel again. Hegel says, I am wrong. But right to be wrong. No ethical consciousness. Is that how he puts it? So I wonder, let's say my unconscious, while remaining unconscious, could also know the laws of consciousness by which I am condemned for disobeying them. I mean, can a person be so completely conscious of being unconscious that she is guilty of her own repression. Is that what I'm guilty of? Well, we all think you're a grand girl. <laughs> is this an argument? I can help you suffer. No, thanks. I can give you reasons not to die. No. I can give you reasons not to kill her. Your own son, for one. Shh. Oh, he'll find other ruts to plow. You women in your beds make me sick. Guards, take them away. Oh, here's Hymen. Here's Hymen in pain and rage, cheated of his future bride. In a rage about your future bride, or are we still friends? <laughs> Father, I'm yours. Good attitude, son. Good heart in your chest. I need you like that. We hold the same friends, damage the same enemies. 
Some children are useless. Some are just trouble. And who would disagree? This makes people <coughs> laugh at the father. A fact of life I'll say to you now. I'll say it one time. When you lay yourself under a, a, a pleasure female, uh, you take an open wound into your house and your life. Spit her out. Let her snake her way down and seduce some boy in hell. You know she disobeyed me. Alone, out of all the city, I will not be made a liar. I'll kill her. Let her call on Zeus and blood and kinship. Who cares? Should I nourish disorder within my own family? No, I should not. My public is watching. Father, the gods grow minds in men as the most precious equipment they have. Yet I could not, would not, do not know how to say, you are wrong. It may be some other way, I don't know, might turn out. I delete this line. I am your defender. I'm yours. I keep watch. No one says or does or disparages any of why your dread eye, your displeasure, no one. Yet, I hear there is talk, there are shadows. This girl, here I posit a lacuna. This girl does not deserve to die. The town is sad. Most glorious of deeds, most terrible of deaths, they say. She only chose to keep her brother's body from raw dogs and eating birds. That sort of talk, I don't know. Night's coming. Oh, Father, when you ride uphill, you gotta shift your weight, pedal to pedal, side to side. Ride the rhythm. Don't hoard your own custom. Don't haul old anger up over your tongue and your mind. They go blind. Trees bend. Ships loosen the rigging. No single human being has perfect knowledge. I like a good argument. Marrow versus marrow. You two could learn from each other. <laughs> Me, at my age, go to school and get wisdom from this stripling. You would learn nothing unjust. Nothing unjust to honor anarchy. I do not honor anarchy. Is the girl not tainted with that malady? Thebes says otherwise. Shall Thebes prescribe to me how I should rule? Listen to yourself. You sound like a boy dictator. Wh whom else should the government depend on? No city belongs to a single man. Well, surely a city belongs to its ruler. Why not find a desert and rule all alone? This fellow, it seems, is the woman's toy. If you are the woman, it's you I care for. Oh, shameless thou utter miscreant to prosecute thine own father. Yes. For I see you doing wrong. Wrong to respect mine own prerogatives? You don't respect. You trample on the prerogatives of the gods. Oh, polluted. Oh, dastard nature. Oh, <coughs> subject to a woman. But not <laughs> subject to injustice. All thy words plead for her. And for you, and me, and the gods below. Thou canst never marry her this side the grave. Then she'll die and take another with her. Doth thy boldness push thee even to threats? Threats? What threats? Thou shalt rue the day of thy witless teaching. If you weren't my father, I'd say you were mad. Thou, woman's chattel, seek not to tickle me. You talk and talk and never listen. Sayest thou so? Well now, well now, I say, <clears throat> thou shalt revile me to thy cost. Fetch out the loathed creature. Let her die hard against her bridegroom. Now, this very instant, 
before his eyes. Never. Well, he's gone. In anger and pain. Let him go, big man. I have deaths to do. Both girls. No, just the loud one. How? Mm, I'll find her in the desert. In the neighborhood, I'll bury her alive with a bit of food. Sacred closet, terrible leisure. No doubt that God of death will save her life. I can no longer restrain the stream of tears when I see Antigone here passing to the room where we all go in the end. Hegel says, people, Daseins, want to see their lives on stage. Look at me. People, I go my last road, I see my last light, look. Death who gathers all of us into his old bent arms in the end is gathering me, but I am still alive. No wedding, no wedding song, no wedding chamber. Yet I shall lie in the bed of the river of death while I am still alive. Yes, but won't you win glory? Won't you be praised? It's not as if you're dying of disease or war. You choose to live autonomous, and so you die. The only one of mortals to go down to death alive. Are you mockers of me? You grabbing old men. Are you laughers at me? Though I'm not gone yet, O oh, springs of the rivers of Thebes, O oh, reaches of the plains of Thebes, bear me witness. No one, no one shed a tear for me as I went to my strange new grave. For I'm a strange new kind of in-between thing, aren't I? Not at home with the dead, nor with the living. You're clumsy, it's true. Clumsy as your father. Remember how Brecht had you do the whole play with a door strapped to your back. Ugh, I don't want to talk about him. <laughs> or him. Or him. All that plowing in the dark. I go to them now. One final intersection. Oh, my brother, you have despoiled me. You despoiled yourself. Piety is nice, but authority is authority. Why must you always make your own laws? You want to repeat that? <laughs> Unwept. Unwed. Unloved. I go. Take her. We are clean of this girl. O oh, tomb, O oh, bridal chamber, O oh, house in the ground forever. I was an organized person, and this is my reward. I organized your deaths, my dear ones, 
All of you, father, mother, brother, when you died, you asked would I have done it for a husband or a child? My answer is no, I would not. A husband or a child can be replaced. But who can grow me a new brother? Is this a weird argument? <laughs> Creon thought so, but I don't know. The words go wrong. They call my piety impiety. I'm alone on my insides. I died long ago. Who suffers more? I wonder who suffers more. Your soul is blowing apart. Get a move on. Next word is death. Death! <laughs> oh, Thebes, oh, gods, oh, look, I go. I'm the last one left in a line of kings. I was caught in an act of perfect piety. Here comes Tiresias. Hail, you kings of Thebes. I begin by addressing the wrong person because I am blind. Is that what you think? Because I am blind? What's up, Tiresias? You are standing on a razor. I hear the birds. They are bee barberries and menzi. They are making monster sounds. The fires won't light. The rights go wrong. You know my technologies. You know. The failing of the sign is in itself a sign. From you, a sickness. From you, a separation from you, a surfeit, comes out upon the city, this pile of rot that was the son of Oedipus. The boy is dead. Stop killing him. You fake. You profiteer. You entrepreneur.
You're too quiet. Watch out, Kim. Watch out. I see the future plunging toward you. And it contains the corpse of your own son. You've made a structural mistake with life and death, my dear. You've put the living underground and kept the dead up here. That is so wrong. That is so wrong. I hate to mention it, but historically, his prophecies are never false. I, 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 I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm shaking. Take advice. Mm. Tell me. Set the girl free. You mean... Quick. 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 I go. O oh people, there is no stanza of human life that I would praise or blame. Luck sends your powerboat up or down the river at any given moment. No seer can see what's next. Creon, I thought, was an enviable man, for he saved this land of Cadmos. He got his hands on monarchy. He sailed it straight, and furrows of children flourished around him. Now, all that's gone. When joy betrays you, I do not count your life alive. A corpse is more alive. Be as rich as you like. Be absolute. If your joy goes, I wouldn't buy you for a shadow of smoke. You're the messenger. What's your message? They're dead. Who's dead? Hyman's dead. By whose hand? A hand very like his own. Okay, Tiresias. Point, match, game. Game's not over. You're right. Here's Eurydice, wife of Creon. What's she up to? This is Eurydice's monologue. It's her only speech in the play. You may not know who she is, that's okay, like poor Mrs. Ramsay who died in the bracket of, to the lighthouse. She's the wife of the man whose moods tensify the world of this story, the world surrounded her. I say, surrounded her, that girl with the undead strapped to her back, a state of exception marks the limit of the law, the violent thing, this fragile thing. Try to unclench, we said to her. She never did. We got her the bike, 
We got a therapist. That poor sad man with his odd ideas. Some days he made us sit on the staircase all on different steps or videotaped us. But when we watched it was nothing but shadows. Finally, we expelled her. We had to, using the logic of friend and foe that she denies. But how can she deny the rule to which she is an exception? Is she autoimmune or is she not? Always exaggerate, exit Eurydice bleeding from all her orifices. Oh, beloved queen, I wish I could say I did not see what was left of Polynikis, the dog-torn parts, the parts lying, the parts gathered, the parts burned on a sacred pile. I wish I could say I did not see the stones shrieking, the girl hanging, the boy a bloody lung, the father on his knees, the bolt leaving the wall, the sword sinking up to its own mouth. O oh, my queen, I did not see death marry them at last, oh so shyly, but I did. I did see it. Exit Eurydice. Exit Eurydice. Exit Eurydice. Too big a silence. Exit messenger. Here comes Creon dragging his. Dragging his. Dragging his. What? Here is my crime. It was my hard killing mind. It was my deadly going wrong. Oh, my child, too soon dead. Oh, this sacrilege that I called public policy. It was my child assassinated by my folly. You're late to learn what's what, aren't you? Late to learn? Oh, yes, I am late to learn. Oh, then, oh, then some god slammed down on me, uh, a heavy weight. Some god shook me out on those raw roads. Alas for the joy of my life that I've trampled underfoot, alas, for us all, going dark. Enter messenger. Okay, Creon. Widen your eyes. What, what now? What worse? Eurydice is dead. Eurydice is dead. Oh, filth of death, who can clean you out? Oh, laugh of death. You crack me. You crack me open. You crack me open again. Here comes Kino. Creon's verb for today. Now he is perfectly blended with pain. You really he cursed you. Your wife cursed you. Assassin of your own child, she said. And she undid her eyes to the dark. Mm, yes, yes, of course, of course she did. She blamed you. And, and then? Stabbed herself in the liver. Yes, yes, she did, of course, in the liver. Yes, I am to blame. Take Creon away! 
he no more exists than someone who does not exist. Briefus is best when evil is all around. <laughs> I want Creon's death. That's the future. This is the present. You deal with the present. <laughs> to die is my only prayer. Then don't pray at all. You don't get to run this. Take Creon away. Uh, please take Creon away. <laughs> uh, where can I look? Where can I turn? Everything I touch goes wrong. An unbearable fate has loaded itself on my head. Last word. Wisdom. Better get some. Even too late. I might start with a question. Um, Avital, we were talking earlier about some of your reservations about the characterization of Hegel in the text. I thought, I wondered if you wanted to speak to that a little bit, if that might be a way to open up the discussion. It's like blasphemy. We had a very private conversation. <laughs> then we discussed making the private conversation public. Yeah, you remember that part? I did not sign off on that. Everyone, thank you so much. I thought you really, um, you, you help, held and carried the performance, and that was amazing. I didn't expect it. Not sure it would have happened in more um, skeptical neighborhoods. So thank you for rocking this. <laughs> so um, I don't want to be a party pooper, but thank you. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you. It is true, and this perhaps allegorizes and nails a certain aspect of what we're trying to think about today, which would be a disjunction between something like the melancholic attentiveness exacted by reading in solitude, in searing solitude. Okay, we won't talk about me. In, um, and then the libidinal upsurge that occurs when you get to perform and move into a different kind of um, modality or relation to language that um, hears itself lifting up in song and shattering in certain ways that perhaps solitude muffles. Okay, so that would be one remark. Does it, you all can hit the pause button, te uh, treat me like a TV, or interrupt as you wish. So when I read the play part that we were to uh, perform in our endless rehearsals, <laughs> I was, I had a little freak out, meltdown, hysteric, but enough about me. Um, and some of, I, I want to say that this, there's, there's of course the moment of exaltation and appreciation and accommodation that one has in relation to text. And then perhaps in a Melanie Kleinian way, there's a little um, something that we started discussing earlier today, a little aggressive, okay, enough about me, but um, a little sense of I would have done this differently and so on and so forth. So I went to the director and expressed with the most uh, judicious vocabulary of, of respect and um, caution that I didn't know what the fuck I was doing here. Uh, I'm not an actress, so therefore, what are the implications of reading a text? Is that co-signing, co-piloting, 
signing on because, and did he mind a slight little nuanced intervention? He said, what is that, my dear? I said, do you mind if I rewrite it? <laughs> and he suggested that would not be respectful to the author, whereas I, Antigone, thought it was the, would have shown the highest respect <laughs> to clean up the shit, you know? So anyway, um, I was also um, inflected by Lacan's reading in the ethics, of course, of the psychoanalysis of Antigone as a little bitch slut, so on and so forth. Yes, that's why I signed on, Creon. You know, finally I could express myself. But. Um, so when you say that you're not an actress, what you mean is that you actually are Antigone. Wait, was this in question? I, I, I'm just trying to understand but the, this line between being an actress and not, and no, okay, performing so and not. I, I go into psychotic fusional things. Oh, psychotic fusion, of course. That's sorry, yeah. different, and you had no right to bring it up here. So um, the other thing that might be left out, so to speak, would be Hegel's jouissance. I mean, to just reduce it to... Hegel, no, maybe that's not the, Hegel said I was wrong. Okay. Hegel interrupts and disrupts his grandiose oeuvre. He says, I really get off on, okay, my translation now. I get off on Antigone. I am so into her. Okay, forget this, forget phenomenology. Antigone's my girl. She's my homie, you know? And there's something going on, as Derrida has pointed out very acutely, and Judith Butler also, um, in her way, on her tracks, um, followed and monitored. Something's going on, and, and Butler is also a bit of a Hegelian herself, so I don't know how she could just sign on without protest, but <laughs> that's her fucking problem. <laughs> you watch out for your life, girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, a little jouissance in France, come on. Or the German stuff, the heavy, beautiful, serious German shit, you know, where you see the complicated itineraries of incorporation that take Hegel down almost when he goes out for Antigone. So the other thing, and I have my shit detectors on, when, and I may be misreading because I'm sometimes blind, not often, by the way. But um, when, when, Just when, you don't when he has, she has Antigone saying, and excuse me, because this is so Christian, and I'm sorry, I can, I'm repeating something, either Christian or Hegelian, um, which is worse, probably, which is death is fine. That doesn't seem um, Greek to me. Do you agree with me? Is that Greek? Are we going to allow that to happen here? Death is fine. Maybe Socrates, as Nietzsche points out in Jams on, you know, lets it happen and, and starts the Christian death march. But for Antigone to, um, to affirm death, I thought that was perhaps going to ruin my reputation, such as it is to have to utter these words. Otherwise, I loved it. I thought it was very great. I'm so happy to be here, and I want to thank, uh, who wrote it? Uh, no. <laughs> I want to thank the author. The translator. The translator. So, yeah, that's an interesting slip there. Are you, are you trying to point up to some extent, um, I mean, when you say that death is fine as a line, is not Greek. Are, are we talking now about the legitimacy of this translation to some extent? I... With Hegel also, is he being mistranslated here in your view? All right, you're trying to trap me, death no, trap I, me no, or no, something? No, no. I have read Benjamin, so I know you can't get away with that shit. And of course the translator is the author that was not a lapsus. Was that? Yeah. Um, I don't do lapses. Um, but I would say that um, translation is so acutely um, um, unbearable 
But for example, to start off with birth, I, I understand in English, let's say, would it have killed her to go with a Ceylonian um, circuitry of what one bears, the unbearable, or maybe with Jean-Luc Nancy's birth to presence, or is that too heavy for you guys? So what uh, I think Avital is referring to is the first line of the translation in which Antigone says, we begin in the dark and birth is the death of us, which is obviously a departure from the Sophoclean opening. Um, and then there's this very interesting thing between Ismene and Antigone. Ismene says, who said that? Hegel sounds more like Beckett. He was paraphrasing Hegel. And if you, I mean, you can trace these citations in the uh, science of logic. Um, Hegel will talk about the, the hour of the birth of the organism is also the hour of the beginning of the decease of the organism and, and also the, the idea that death is contained within the seed of, you know, of birth, of creation. And on the Beckett side, there's um, this extraordinary monologue called A Piece of Monologue from the 70s um, where the, the male character repeats this line, um, birth was the death of him, too much, too much, etc., etc. And he, he repeats all of that stuff. Uh, I, I, I want to kind of open this up a bit, maybe. I don't know, Judith, if you have any thoughts of, about any of that. Uh, Can I just say one more thing sure. before she starts talking <laughs> and takes over my space? Um, I just want to say, did it have to just stay with the simplicity? It wasn't that simple because she started a deconstructive move on the door which isn't inside or outside. But from since Ceylon, the door is the law. Okay, she didn't have to sneak that in. But since we're in France, we could have also maybe considered what foutre à la porte indicates and means, and what it means to carry a door. Okay, I can't believe I just asked that question. Just, uh, we, uh, we welcome your contributions and questions. I'm going to send these roving mics, some of them, out there. So just put your hand up if you want to add anything or, or shout. I mean, take, take her at a word, I think. I'm after, I mean, as Judith is speaking. In addition to that, I'm sorry. I just I feel we're a bit insular here. So, yeah, please. No, please speak as, as much as you want. Okay, so much. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, first of all, thank you all for um, doing this, for this chance to do this together. I, I think it's enormous fun. Um, but I also, um, I, I just wanted to say two things about this kind of writing. Um, I mean, Anne Carson is known in English as a, a, a established classicist, a superb translator. And she knows what the sort of proper act of translation is supposed to be. And in some ways, she's, um, uh, she's doing two things uh, to contest uh, a more traditional translation practice. The first thing she's doing is, is to translate literally and allow for some of the very awkward and funny um, 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 uh, connotations of those literal translations to simply exist. For instance, the famous Ode to Man, which is the basis of many philosophical reflections, including Heidegger's. Um, you know, she, she starts it with, many terribly quiet customers exist, but none more terribly quiet than man. I mean, that is a, in, in a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a quite literal translation, taking two parts of that term and showing what they might sound like in a more contemporary idiom, it allows the seriousness of the text to be sacrificed some. Um, and, it, and then here's my second point. It, it's also actively seeking to deflate the high philosophical appropriation of Antigone, include, including mine, right? Including Derrida, including Hegel, including everybody who's, who, who she has, including Brecht. Right, at, at each uh, so-called um, critic or philosopher who seeks to uh, make something of this in a serious way enters into the text um, 
and produces a kind of an anachronism where, you know, Eurydice is talking about the daughter going to therapy, um, and she allows those temporal frames to cross in such a way and to, and to have um, quotidian life or uh, la, la vie ordinaire, you know, to, to uh, coexist in a contemporary way with this ancient text. So there's a, there are a series of interruptions of its seriousness. And, and then just finally, I would say that it would be worth thinking about the difference between Avital Ronell's sense of humor which does also move between the high and the low, and Anne Carson's particular practice, which moves between the high and the low, but in a very different way. And I think that what she has done is to receive the interpolation of woman as the irony of the community, and she's, she's producing an ironic text in, in a way from that position, but I think her irony is, is not your humor, and somebody who doesn't yet have a thesis topic should write on that, because that would be very, very interesting. <laughs> Freddie. Yeah. May, may I just say that I, I think one of the most misunderstood uh, interpretations of, of Antigone is Brecht's uh, adaptation, which he did in Switzerland, where Helene Weigel walked with the door, and she was given the door when she says, I can't deny I did it. Uh, and, and this door is like a cross, which then becomes the shackles of the horses in Mother Courage, which is also a cross. And, and, and I think that for those of you who really want to see what it looked like, go to Ruth Berlau's photographs in the Modellbuch, which was Brest's first Modellbuch, and you will see something very powerful of his interpretation and I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that she disapproves of Brecht but, but, but there is a lot of irony there and the door is there also in Eurydice's speech I think the door, the, the sort of this, this face inside outside, the door outside the witch in Brecht's version of Antigone which begins in Berlin the brother is, has been killed because he brought food to his sisters so there is a lot, there is a lot going on and I think it's it's, it's a very powerful uh, knowledge that, that is coming here, and I think there is a lot of irony in it, and, and I, 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 I don't take everything seriously, but, but the Brecht one I want to defend somehow. Well, yeah, I mean, if we think back to the, that introductory text, uh, and says, you know, perhaps Brecht got you best, yeah, to, to st what, what does it mean to stand outside your own door? So I think, yeah, I think there's a real affinity with, the, with that Brechtian vision, yeah, absolutely. Um, John. I just wanted to, to um, remind folks that, that know the book and those that don't know the book that it's actually a multimedia book and it's a collaboration. So those images you saw, and that has been erased, and I, I will erase it right now because I can't remember the graphic designer. I know, this and is, a, a this is terribly remiss of us. So these images so are, uh, oh God, that's, no, that's something else entirely. <laughs> Hold on. Um, so these images are by an extraordinary uh, visual artist who's also a poet from New York by the name of Bianca Stone and if I could easily locate it I would show you all the book that this is published in. You saw with Eurydice's monologue the way the text is laid out. There's an example right there. You can buy it at all good bookstores. <laughs> it's an extraordinary book. The, these uh, illustrations are printed on vellum on this kind of transparent paper which overlays this text, which is hand-lettered by Carson and Robert Curry, who is uh, a frequent collaborator of Anne's and is a graphic designer. So yes, it's a very important point. Thank you, John. And I would also say, philosophically, yeah. is that the introduction of graphy into logos? That would be, is that the move that she's making? I, just I think that's a really interesting point, yeah. We have a question up the back. Can we send this? Yeah, we need to finish, okay. Okay, great.
Thank you for the question. We're on a, um, we're ticking down now, so I will just uh, say very briefly that we would want to extend your question and, and uh, perhaps fold it back on itself by wondering about our relation to any text or work or fictional or not perhaps and spectral colloquy that we're engaged in. What are we doing when we're reading and um, what are the investments and, and desiring, um, let's say, apparatus that are switched on. All I wanted to say about Hegel was to remind you that it was such a spectacular um, kind of transferential machine that, that switched on for him in his relation in not only one work, but several works to Antigone that um, I, I, um, I hope I, uh, well, Creon, Judith Butler really brought the law back down, but I was, um, I was hoping to, to explore with you what that transferential um, and, and kind of passionate appropriation can mean, and should it be bracketed out or reduced to something like Hegel said I was wrong, even one sentence, I know that I can't believe I'm doing this. This is a sickness, a pathology. You get that hysteria thing was not a mistake. This is what we're seeing, you know, of how I would have wanted certain things adjusted to accommodate what is incalculable and what it means for Hegel not to have been able to forget this phantom of love, phantom desire, or the desire of a phantom. Good question. We do need to finish, but I just want to add one or two things to that. The first is that um, Jay Bernstein has an extraordinary article uh, recently published called The Celestial Antigone, which is itself a quote from, I believe, the philosophy of history, Hegel. Anyway, a later text of Hegel's, in which he returns to Antigone and talks about her as uh, celestial and something like the most radiant figure to have ever appeared on the earth. So that's, I mean, that's kind of a point to you there, right? That there is, there is something in addition to, to whatever ethical judgment there is on Hegel's part of Antigone and Creon, uh, and, and, and whatever attempt there is to systematize or to, to make an example of the dialectic of, of this, you know, incalculable figure in some way, there is also an acknowledgement on Hegel's part of, yeah, of like, and, and so Jay Bernstein will say, the first line of the article is, Hegel loved Antigone, exorbitantly. So, I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I agree entirely with his reading, but it's an interesting line of inquiry. But, you know, the other thing I think just to say again in, in Carson's defense is that I think there's enormous room within this text, and this will depend now on how one goes to produce it or direct it or whatever one does with this strange thing, which is not quite a play text. But there's enormous room, I think, within it to explore that exact um, dynamic. You know, she if Antigone is merely rejecting Hegel's judgment of her in some simplistic way, why does Antigone continue to cite Hegel? Why does she come back again and again and, and even in the moment of her death saying, Hegel, like, Hegel says that people want to see their lives on stage. I mean, you bridle at the, the sort of the simplicity of the, world, pe of the word people, but I, I think that's a vernacular thing. Anyway, we need to finish. Okay, can we oh, hold on, hold on. Tim wants to say in, in Ann Carson's, as a gesture to Ann Carson, I just wanted to call your attention to the pivot that she makes at the beginning of the play, which is in this little bit of a part that I had on the guard, which is that Ann Carson is very sensitive to the shift between noun and verb. Um, and there's a distinct differentiation between whether Antigone is indeed this noun of bereft, melancholic admiration, or whether there's a verbal gerundive push out um, that the acting of Antigone brings to the fore. And of course, that then brings us back to perhaps more contemporary um, post-structural philosophical sensibilities around the verb. Okay, can we have one more round of applause? And thank you.